This is the, the, the Analysis in Chains with Nathan Williams and Neil Kieran. <laughs> Welcome to Analysis in Chains by Crypto News, your daily source of all things crypto. We are here today with Benjamin Jessel, the head of growth at Kadena. Kadena is a rather interesting uh, pro project that is dealing with the throughput issue. And um, so thank you very much, Benjamin, for joining. Thanks, Nathan, for having me on the podcast. So tell me a little bit about Kadena. It seems that you have a lot of stuff going on with uh, with Kadena right now. If, uh, I read through your white paper. It's highly technical, as is usual for sort of a primary blockchain. But what's really the key issue that you guys are trying to solve? Thanks, Nathan. So if you look at where we are with blockchain technology as a whole, um, it's uh, been profound the level of uh, capability that's been developed just in the last year alone. Uh, you know, we've seen Ethereum that's processed, I think it's about $6 billion worth of initial coin offerings uh, purely in this uh, year to date alone, uh, rivaling what was done in the whole of last year. Um, you know, we're seeing uh, programmable blockchains taking form, you know, across many different parts of, of, of uh, lots of industries. Um, but that said, a lot of these technologies have pushed us to a level of maturity, but are beginning to outgrow their actual capability. And what I mean is um, the elements of scalability, security, and what I call simplicity as well. So taking the first one around scalability um, and speed, um, if you look at the blockchain platforms out there currently, um, they are fast but slow by the context of large networks. For example, the Visa network is a uh, 25,000 transactions a second uh, peak burst speed. Uh, sure. A lot of the, uh, the blockchains that you have um, you know, provided by um, well-known organizations today you know, can do about 2,000 or so. Um, and, and if speed is one as ASIC axis, another axis to look at is um, scalability, the amount of nodes you can have on a network before the performance starts to degrade. And that is um, concerning at the moment because these networks degrade quickly if they're using, um, you know, true blockchain technology just because of some of the limitations of, of, of the technology itself. I guess that makes sense. If you've got so many like nodes that are all solving one set of problems, then uh, then if you add exponentially, eventually, like everyone's working on the same problem, and uh, and you have a communication issue, you've got uh, latency, you've got power consumption issues. Yeah, it's ultimately that 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 traveling sales problem. That as soon as you add another node or a network uh, location, you are you know increasing your. Uh, uh, gossip, as it's called, um, uh, exclamationally. Um, so that's kind of one issue that we're seeing, that there's been a, a real limitation from Fortune 500 organizations adopting this in, in anything approaching what we call high transactional um, situations. The other challenge that we're also seeing is uh, the languages that are currently used today have some challenges. And what I mean by that is, if you look at some of the smart contract programming languages, they are um, used, um, for example, there's Java, there's Go, uh, there's Solidity. There are languages which are very broad in nature. Uh, and because they're broad, they're used for a number of different purposes, both for smart contract languages, but also for uh, developing enterprise-grade transactional systems and computer games. And one thing we're noticing is that the use of these languages causes a degree of complexity. Um, it's very easy to introduce bugs in a complex programming language. I mean, the parity bug, for example, is a perfect example of a very complex pro um, implementation uh, where there a bug was found in the code and lots of people lost their money. Uh, similar with the DAO attack as well. And mm. just uh, if you look at those two alone, I think the DAO was about 50 million and um, the, uh, the, the parity bug was between 170 and 300 million. So as enterprise organizations are looking at this technology, they're, they're, they're seeing that the, the, the throughput's not there. They're seeing this complexity of, of programming language. But also what you need to remember is that smart, smart contracts are a real change to the way that um, business and technology and legal and compliance and audit are all going to have to work together. You know, in the olden mm -hmm. days, oh, sorry, sorry, Nathan, you're going to say something. Oh, no, no. I was just going to say that it's, uh, it, it is interesting that you bring up these things because with smart contracts, what a lot of people who get started in them don't realize is that 
the you have additional problems that come in just because they all have to run in parallel. Absolutely. Right. So, you know, if you, it's one thing to have a computer program that just runs from beginning to end all at once. But once you start introducing multiple copies of a program all running at the same time, affecting say a, a wallet, then there can be no uh, uh, interactions that you haven't thought of, like the parity bug, where, or like uh, like the DAO. That what the the issue with the DAO was is that it checked something off chain to see if uh, if a condition had been met, and if so, then it would allow you to withdraw funds. And so, if you have two programs running at the same time, one checked off chain, and then the other one withdrew all the funds uh, without having to do the check. And it, it just ended up being a massive, uh, a massive fraud, but that is very difficult for a human to think of. Very difficult. And so if you can imagine putting this into the enterprise context, I mean, look at the derivatives markets, for example. Um, uh, you know, I've had some experience in that market, and it's, it's, it's a very inefficient market. It's all what we call over the counter, or a, lot, a large amount is over the counter. So it's, it's individual traders working together to, to create contracts which are executed um, usually by teams of operations folks um, looking through contracts and checking data. So, you know, the, the thought is, yes, you can absolutely automate it. But the reality is, is that the level of complexity and the stakes involved, if you get it wrong, are so high, that you'd never have a traditional implementation where a business analyst would write a requirements document, pass it on to the tech guy who would write it, and then it would get tested and then you're done. Oh, no, you know, in the new world, you have compliance and audit and legal. They're going to actually want to read the code uh, and make sure that they're certain that it's going to work because you now tie your payment systems of, let's say, two banks inextricably together. Uh, and that's a far higher stake than, than what we've seen before. Now, in reality, you may not get, you know, payment systems all tied together between uh, multiple organizations, but you're still going to be taking business logic and effectively turning it over to a machine. And legal audit and compliance are going to want to really understand the test that actually works. And I think that's a very different model than what we've seen in the past. And you have this blending of skills between lawyers who are now programmers, programmers who are lawyers, uh, compliance experts who are now very good at coding. So it, it's, it's very much a kind of emerged uh, set of skill sets that we're seeing now. Hmm. And that's a problem for business. No, it does make sense. I mean, I think it's just sort of a... a something that we should expect as uh, technology advances is that uh, jobs get more technical. They do. You know, like, uh, yeah, it's, it's absolutely a requirement now for, uh, for people to understand and work with computers, whereas it wasn't 30 years ago. And now, uh, you know, the requirement for lawyers to actually understand at least the basics of uh, programming is going to be important as smart contracts become more and more uh, in the norm. Yeah, great, Nathan. Hmm. So, um, what's interesting is like w with this problem, like I was reading through your white paper, and uh, you've got a couple of different things going on with uh, with Kadena in order to address these, right? So, um, I was looking at first of all your smart contract language, right? And this this was interesting. I think it's called Pact. Is that correct? That's correct, yes. All right. So uh, as I understand it, you were trying to have a, more of a human-readable language as opposed to something like Solidity. That's right. And, and the, the, the light bulb went off in um, Stuart Popejoy, who, who architected this, in, in his mind, actually, when in his days in J.P. Morgan. Yeah. Um, and back in those days, he was working with traders, the unenviable position of being a technologist working with traders and a Wall Street firm. Um, and these traders were having to implement their clients' requirements, um, which would be algorithmic by nature. If the VIX spikes, then do X, Y, and Z. Um, and uh, before Stuart was involved, this was taking some considerable time to build these algorithms because it would get shipped off to IT and it would come back. And what Stuart realized was that if he could give a programming language to traders who are very numerate but aren't necessarily going to be good at coding and provide them with the tools, then they could cut out the middleman and effectively provide a lot of that power of that knowledge directly uh, translated into, um, into a, uh, a system that can action on behalf. So PACT is kind of really a, 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 a version of that concept, which says, let's make it easy for everyone. And I think one of the other problems that you, that you see in the market today is that even when you build a smart contract, in many uh, platforms, it becomes compiled down to something that you can, just, you can never understand because it's computer language, which is fine. But the problem is, is that, as we all know, developing 
pieces of code these days isn't just about building it from scratch. It's about borrowing and referencing other uh, developed pieces of smart contract. Now, the problem is, is if it's all compiled down to some mush that no one can understand, how do you know if what you are referencing is actually what you think it is? And then how do you ensure that someone doesn't change that later? You know, the, the famous example was there was a small piece of code called LeftPad, um, which um, there's a very, very simple thing um, in terms of moving some text around. Um, but because it's become so ubiquitous, organizations such as Facebook use it. Mm. Uh, and then one day this person decided to pull their code uh, because they were in a contract dispute and it broke the internet. And what we have today is a version of that out in the real world that, you know, if organizations are referring to some common module um, around their code, people can pull that off, they can change that, they can do some nefarious things. So part of what we want to do is to say, no, let's make everything completely readable all the time and let's make it very clear how code is pulled in and then have an ability to upgrade as well. So this kind of language is trying to solve a lot of those problems. I like to call it the SQL for blockchain. You know, it's simple for a reason because we don't want to be too complex because you don't need to be with blockchain. It does make sense. I mean, like when I hire a, a junior programmer or anyone below a, a senior level, actually, I just expect that what I'm hiring is someone to Google uh, Google a problem and then look it up on SourceForge and then copy paste some code. Um, <laughs> yeah, guilty. <laughs> and yeah, yeah, yeah. I think a lot of people are guilty in that one. Um, what, what, the question I have about that, though, is by making smart contract language simpler, do you have to reduce the functionality in order to make sure people don't break things? We do reduce functionality, but we believe that what's been reduced isn't something that people are going to necessarily um, need if they're truly doing just transactional systems. So in a similar way that with SQL, you know, you're limited in what you can do. Um, no one's ever said, you know, if only I could do this in SQL. I mean, all right, there's variants that have kind of come over the top to make it more powerful, but they're kind of things that you'd never really normally use, like recursion, unbounded loops, mm. things like that. You know, if you're doing a transactional thing, you want to actually iterate through everything in a, um, you know, in a variable set. You don't want to be doing some of these other things. So, you know, I think what we've proved out is that that language is well-formed and doesn't necessarily need any, any kind of extension at the moment. You know, because it's open source, though, you know, if we're wrong, mm. then there's a community to, to evolve it over time. That does make sense. Uh, so uh, is it Turing complete or no? It uh, is Turing incomplete, and the, re incomplete. the reason for that is it also means we can run this code through what's called a formal methods verification system. Uh, and that means we can prove mathematically uh, with logic uh, that a piece of code can only do the certain things we expect it to do. And if it doesn't, it'll flag up, and then we can make changes. So, you know, really enterprise-grade software. It's a kind of technique used in nuclear power stations and mission-critical systems like airplanes and, and things of that kind of nature. No, it, it absolutely makes sense. And I, I actually want to move on from this, but I do find it interesting because like, it, it, it is important that when you're dealing with uh, with a programming language that it's dealing with the right problem. And the problem that you're trying to solve isn't to come up with the next really understandable Turing complete language. It's to make sure that accountants and, uh, and people that are actually using it can just write their own code without having to go to the IT department and having something go through multiple, uh, levels of testing. Yeah. Um, but uh, I wanted to bring up uh, the actual white paper because I actually read it through it this morning and I found it really interesting of how you're solving sort of the, the throughput. Now, we talked with a couple of different companies that are all have uh, are trying to compete for the next generation uh, blockchain that's going to solve all the throughput. And, uh, you know, the, some of them are doing various types of sharding and various types of uh, proof of work. And I just found it interesting, this idea of the chain web. Absolutely. That uh, that you guys are dealing with. So, like, it, I'm going to try and just say say it and see if I, how, how accurate it is. The idea is that instead of having one layer of computers that are all solving sort of the same proof of work block, and so all of this energy goes into the same one. You have multiple sort of chains that, or that are doing proof of work, but incorporated into their blocks are a hash of other chains that are going on. So you've got this weird web uh, of all of these things being connected because if you've got the hash of someone else, uh, of another chain going on somewhere else, then it's not necessarily easy to 
fake or to fork uh, the, uh, the, the the this chain web as a whole because it, you would have to fa- uh, to fork all of the side chains at the same time. Is, is that more or less accurate? Nathan, that's exactly right. Uh, it took me a couple of goes of the white paper to, to, to get to something as, as concise as you managed to articulate it. Yeah, it's a little bit like having a, an interstate where you can just add additional lanes when you need them, but also you have the ability to move between lanes as well. And I think it, it's, it's an interesting element that the security actually goes up as you add more chains because it's, it's the sum of the hashing and difficulty of all of the chains. So you actually get a, additional confidentiality for free as you start moving up that. Um, so it's a very exciting uh, um, uh, opportunity we've got there because it's going to be uh, a lot faster than anything that's currently available on, on, on the public chain side. And we think that's going to be a game changer. So what stage are you guys at with this right now? I mean, it looks really good on paper, but I mean, has it gone to testnet? Has it gone to like people actually using it? Uh, not yet. Uh, we have taken this around uh, some various uh, forums, for example, the uh, Stamford BPACE uh, forum uh, uh, earlier last year, um, and really just uh, taken it to, to some individuals and groups that can really, you know, throw some darts in and make sure that it's absolutely watertight. And the good news is that so far it's, it's held up. Uh, we've just closed on a round of funding, which will help us build this. And we're looking to uh, implement a test net in the summer um, with a go live uh, towards the end of the end of the year. Now, we do have a private chain already, mm-hmm. and that is uh, being used by a Fortune 100 company. So we actually do have product in market that works today. And then obviously we have our, our packed um, uh, programming language, which uh, exists, has been used, and is open source as well. So it's an interesting time of our life. Uh, um, and uh, the company that's Kadena, you know, we have some things developed and deployed and used, other things on the drawing board, but funded. Um, it'll be interesting uh, six or eight months. No, it, it will be. It certainly will be. Um, now, there's a lot of a lot of companies that are trying to, you know, build on top of the you know, uh, uh, of someone else's blockchain. If you don't have a Turing complete programming language, um, does it make sense like uh, for, uh, for a token sale to maybe do their token on top of Pact, even though it's not Turing complete? Or is that something like dealing with uh, foreign tokens that you're not planning on getting into? Um, so while we would need it to be Turing incomplete at the moment, just because that's how we, we've designed our, our, our system, one thing that we can do, which I think is um, a real benefit of our platform, is that we can effectively move tokens with the same elliptic curve cryptography. That is to say that it uses the same mechanism to secure the token onto our chain. And the way that we can do this is that we can escrow what we're going to call Kadena coin and then release it only once we're certain that a certain transaction has taken place. So if me and you, Nathan, were to um, transfer uh, Bitcoin, me to you, then I could have a contract that is self-governing escrow on Kadena coin that says only once I've seen that I've given the Bitcoin to Nathan and I've received that key and I can validate it or that hash, will I now release the Kadena coin? So, you know, we have a kind of a mechanism in terms of being able to move um, tokens or certainly value into our network, which, um, well, it doesn't exactly answer your question, Nathan. It's another route that we can take. Yeah, no, I, I think I was more more thinking uh, in terms of, um, uh, are you looking to displace Ethereum? Oh, I'm sorry, Nathan. Um, so we, we think there is a world where uh, Ethereum can coexist um, with other providers such as uh, Kadena. Um, now, Kadena is very much focused on high availability, uh, programming uh, a program- programmable blockchain with high availability um, and high throughput. Um, so what we're anticipating is that there will be a section of the market that will find this very attractive uh, and will gravitate to this. One thing we're able to do is to have dedicated chains just for things such as initial coin offerings. So rather than the, the risk of the, uh, the, an ICO being um, compromised by, you know, let's say CryptoKitties or some other game that's being run, you can actually dedicate bandwidth just purely for that ICO. Uh, and I think that's going to become increasingly important you know, as we see um, you know, the ICO activity continue to burgeon in that space. 
Yeah, that no, that makes sense. Look, we're almost out of time. I wanted to ask you a couple of things, though, just about adoption. Because, I mean, right now, you guys are building your own chain, right? So you build your own chain. You're probably dealing with uh, the challenges that everyone who's building their own chain is, which is, uh, you know, getting getting new nodes, getting people to adopt it, getting exchanges, and uh, and uh, and I guess the, the the real question is, you know, we don't have a clear winner for protocol yet, and um, and do you see that as being a block to more widespread adoption by like the mass market of blockchain technology of uh, of using crypto or and how how do you imagine overcoming that in the future? Yeah, and I think actually the the um the adoption generally across blockchain has been stymied um, by um, the fact that there hasn't necessarily been that next generation of technology yet. So what I'm anticipating, and I think you know, Will and, and Stuart co-founders share this, this view, is that as platforms such as Kadena come to market and can provide high um, throughput, low latency capabilities, you're going to start seeing a lot more organizations turn into blockchain because all of the fears and concerns they had initially around security, scalability, and things like that will have uh, been mitigated. And so I think that alone is going to drive um, a adoption in the industry. And, you know, it's entirely possible that some folks will come from, from the Ethereum crowd onto Kadena. But I believe that the market's going to be uh, expanding enough um, so that we'll all have a part to play within this ecosystem. Hmm. I guess it does make sense. I, I think that there's, uh, like, my personal point of view is that the... It, the adoption is both ease of use based, but also just whether it solves a problem. And I think throughput is absolutely one of the things that needs to be solved for sort of widespread adoption, at least by business to business uh, applications. Um, yeah. So anyway, best of luck in uh, in what you're doing, and I hope it uh, hope it goes really well in uh, in your next phases. Um, thank you for joining me. Benjamin Jessel is the uh, head of growth at. Kadena, kadena.io. You can, if you want to find out more about them, thank you for coming on the show. Thanks, Nathan. I appreciate it. Enjoyed it.